जयेश माता जी ऑनलाइन उपस्थित सभी सहयोगी भाई बहनों का आज के ध्यान सत्र में हार्दिक स्वागत है कलेक्टिव बंधन
चित्त सहस्त्रार पे प्रार्थना करते हैं परम पुजिष्ठ माता जी कृपा कर हमारे आत्म साक्षात्कार को दृढ़ कीजिए हमें पूर्ण संतुलन प्रदान कीजिए कुशन इसी ध्यान की अवस्था में बैठते हैं माता जी की अमृत वाणी को ग्रहण करते हैं टुडे इज अ ग्रेट डे टू ब्राइटन बिकॉज इज द डे ऑफ बुद्धास बर्थ टुडे इज बुद्धास बर्थ डे लॉर्ड बुद्धास बर्थ डे यू ऑल है heard about his birth and that his mother dreamt of an elephant of a large white elephant before the birth of buddha and then it was predicted that a child will be born in your family who will be either a great saint or a very great king as in sanskrit called chakravarti he is the one who is the ruler of the whole world so the father got worried and he thought he must get the son involved into the family life into material life and give him all the pleasures of life so he built a very special place for him beautiful palace to live in and where he got he married to a girl called Ishodra was a very very beautiful woman gave him all the pleasures of life everything that he could do to entice this boy away from asceticism also you know the story of his boy 
one day on the road how he found three types of people and how he felt that why a person should become old why should a person suffer in life and why should people die so all these three things put an inquiry into himself and he started trying to understand why these things happen to human beings with this the inquiry start so uh he reached a point where he could not bear any more the comforts and the all the attachments that were entangled around him by his father he had a son whose name was rahul and he left the son and the wife in the search of the truth now he started from a wrong end i should say for the search of the truth because he wanted to know why there are miseries in the human beings and so he started from collecting towards the set when we see miseries all around us many people have seen this and what about others will everybody get realized will everybody will have this you see this comes from the wrong and i feel because first of all we must know are we all right have we are we perfect are we full of joy have we received the absolute knowledge if you start from this point is always better because he started from the wrong point searching it from the collective to remove the miseries of the people he had to go in a very round about so he read all the books and vedas and they she went to big pandits to all the great knowledgeable people to meet them, to ask them the answer why there are these three things that is the yoga is the health or miserable physical body then the death and the old age went and asked so many people and they said you have to die because you are born and then they said that you have to become old because you are born like that and you have to suffer because you come exits he was not satisfied with the answer so he went on searching and searching and searching and then he got tired absolutely fed up when he went to a place called gaya very near patna it is i have seen the place and the tree and he sat under a banyan tree where he slept out because he got so tired of his sleep and after the sleep he got up and suddenly he got his daylight and he thought the whole drama is over now his mother herself was adi shakti who gave him the birth and she died just after the birth of the child and he got this relapse now at that time when he got his realization there was nobody to tell him what it is that what it means realization is nobody to deport or talk about anything that was to be understood by him but because of his tremendous seeking and such ardent desire that the shuddha icha 
Kundalini itself rose. But of course, the Adi Shakti blessed him and he got his realization under the banyan tree. Now, any incarnation which came on this earth had to samayachar according to the time. The need of the time had to act. Firstly, secondly, the need of the incarnation to come on this earth was first created in the human being. So, supposing at a time when there was too much of ritualism, Brahmanism or priesthood and people were trying to take everything onto those artificial rituals and all that, an incarnation had to come on this earth to correct those ideas. Like Krishna came at a time when he said, this is all Leela with puja and everything he can do. Nothing do. No puja, nothing. You just have ras. Enjoy yourself. It's all a joke going on. See? So he brought that concept at that time in the awareness of people that the whole world is a Leela, is a play of God's own whims. So you just enjoy it. And that's how he created this uh, wonderful festival of Holi, which we had in Delhi. I don't know. Any one of you who was there for the Holi? No. You were there? Two years back. No, but this time you were not there. All right. You might get the pictures of that. All right. So in the same way, when Buddha came in, first problem was that he thought that it is better not to talk about God. Because in his search, everybody told him the answer was, Oh, it's God who does it. He punishes you. It's God who gives you this old age. It's God who does it. But what is this God after all? Why does he do it? He said, You better ask the God. Where is the God? So everybody put every blame on God as usual. Even that's not good. Nothing new. And nothing unusual, I should say. So, this must be done by God. <laughs> if you cut your throat, God put my knife in my hand and He cut my throat. <laughs> so, you see, He thought better not talk of God. Because everybody is going towards God. Then the people whom He met, they said, Now I have become God. He said, How? He said, I am God. Oh, what? Why? Because he could mesmerize people, he said, I've become God. Just to that. So he thought that is very dangerous to talk of God because people take God in the hand and use it for their own purpose. Always say, Oh, this is what the God has to do, and it's God has done it, and I'm in connection with God, and I'll tell God. So he got a fright and he said, it's better not talk about God because that puts the attention of the people on ritualism, artificial things, they are building temples after temples and just doing all these horrible things which one should not do. Like if you go to the south, you'll find the, in the temples, they shave their heads of the leaves, they shave it completely. And that they have to, this all cobbled on all the sides of the wall, sub-walls of the temple. And the ladies who shave their head are just rolling along the sides. You see. They have to do it sometimes, one thousand and eight times, rolling. Yes. And the water is poured on them. God knows what is the ritual from where it has come. So the poor women go on rolling, rolling, rolling like that. And somebody is pouring water on them all the time, buckets after buckets. <laughs> the husband and the brother and all they bring one after another. You see, one is finished and another one is poor lady is rolling like that on that muddy uh, sort of a cobbled area. I mean, I was shocked when I saw this. That's the worst thing. And then later on, you see, they became modern. So they started selling the hair, you see, abroad. 
So the whole thing became a big industry in Madras, you see. The hair was made into this bouffant and all that you turn it into hair. Went <laughs> to England and other places. So it's I mean in the name of God, ridiculous things were done. Ridiculous things were done. So he just thought better not talk about God. The first step is self realization. He was a great Sahaja Yogi Amitra. Because he said, nothing doing, don't talk about God or anything. First you get your realization. That was the first realization. Establish it. Unless and until you have established your realization, nothing doing. So he just started his own method of propagating Buddhi, Buddha's knowledge or you can Buddhism, you know, they call it. Of course, it became ism later on. So all that he started with the idea that people should first become Buddha. <clears throat> Buddha means realize. Buddha is to know. So Buddha means the person who has known, <coughs> means the one who is a realized. So what he says, Buddham Sharanam Gacham. I bow, no, I surrender. Sharanam means sharanam. I surrender to the Buddhas. Means to all the Sajogis. We are all Buddhas. Because you know. When you know, you are the Buddha. Now, without going into all that nonsense of renunciation and shaving your head and wearing that dress and everything, you have achieved your realization. It's a short circuit or a short path. Why? Because he started from the other side. But if he had started directly from himself, you see, it would have been better. You see, in practical sense, I'll tell you how it is. Supposing you want to repair your house. So, you have to have instrument for that house. But supposing you are worried about all the houses in the world and you start repairing. Neither you will repair other houses nor yours. So first you must practice on yourself. Put your attention to yourself. It also is a method by which you avoid seeing the point, seeing the reality that if you are not all right, how can you improve, you improve the whole world? So when your attention goes to other things, you must know that there is something wrong with you first of all, which must be right. And that's why it took him so much time to go round and round and round. He had to give up his wife, give up his family, give up everything and get to realization. Because by giving up everything, he realized that it is he who should achieve. It's a very circuitous way. But you can just say it doesn't exist anything, first let me get all right. That's so much. Now, what happened? That became a method for people to achieve God. Many people think that you must suffer like Christ to achieve God. You must uh, renounce the world, then achieve God. Actually, renouncing the world and all that is just a myth. How do you renounce the world? It's myth. What are you renouncing? I mean, in any case, you can't carry this with you, can you? I mean, can you even carry, I would say, even a thread? Nothing. When you come, you come like this. You are born with close face. When you go, the hands are like this. Oh. Have you ever seen a dead corpse? The young has have his hands like this. Nothing. Just going like this. So you don't take anything from here. So this renouncing, this, I renounce that, I renounce that, I give up this, I give up my wife, I give up that. Has no meaning. Because it's a state of mind in which your being becomes, I don't know the English word for that, which doesn't stick to something what is required. Hmm? No, no, no. You see, any, any substance that doesn't stick anything. I mean, we have all kinds of stick plants. Unattached. No? Hmm? Unattached. No, no, but that quality, 
that's a quality of the temperament which doesn't stick to it. Doesn't stick to anything. I mean, you put it here, it will come out. You can say the soap. Or something like that. Like mercury, mother. Huh? Like mercury, it just flows. Ha, ah, like mercury. But mercury also you can apply sometimes you know, with heat. And, but this is something beyond mercury. It's absolute. Which doesn't stick to anything. You see? You just become like that. Oh, you do that, this, you wear that, you have this, all right. You are never. The name of the goddess is Nirmama. Nirmama. That she, for her nothing is her own. You see, she doesn't stick to it. She is in everything, but she doesn't stick to it. For example, now see the light here. It's not sticking to anything. It exists by itself. It doesn't stick to anything. This is the nearest you can say. It doesn't stick to anything. Any but thing tries to stick it, you see, it gets burned. That's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> so this is what it is, it's called an enlightened person, doesn't stick to it. And whatever tries to come very close gets burnt out. So such a person is not attached to it. But that's not a mental thing that you can do that, oh, I'm not attached to you. See, it's very common in this country especially, I hate you. But you can't hate anyone. How can you? And nor can you love anyone because the attachment cannot give you both the qualities. You see, because you are attached to someone, you say that you hate, simultaneously you are loving that. Because these are the dual qualities of attachment. See? So once you have attachment, you have both things. One moment you hate, another moment you love. Another moment you hate, then you love and you don't know what's the matter with yourself. But the thing is, the quality of the mind is such that it is either getting attached mentally or either getting detached mentally. But actually, anybody say you love someone very much. No, you don't even die together, whatever you may try. You cannot die together. One person has to die earlier, another has to die later. So the answer to his question that he asked was, why all these things are caused? So he said, it is because of desire. Because of human desire, desire, all problems are caused, like the death, like the uh, old age or the sick are caused by desire. Now see, in Sahaja Yoga language, how we should understand him. Is the desire, as you know, is the left side. Left side gives you death. When the left side is very much used, you get to death, ultimately when it is exhausted. When the left side is out, desire, you also get sickness. And when the left side is used too much, you get your old age. Of course, the right side is the one which does it, but the left side is the originator. If you have no desire, you won't go into the right side. First is the desire. The starting point is the desire. He reached the point all right, but he didn't clearly say what desire means. Desire means the left side. When we have the pure desire, which is the Kundalini, then all these things are neutralized. When the Kundalini rises, the pure desire, the real desire, the only desire, it gives you the absolute by which you don't get old, you don't die, and you do not get sick. Because you achieve that which is eternal. It does not die. You become the spirit. 
when you want to die, you die. When you want to be reborn, you are reborn. And you have that realized temperament within you. It does not die. That's what you take with you. Now you take your realization with you when you die. So what he tried to say was to build up that we should not have any desires. Now, because, you see, his passage was like that. He went from one to another, giving up this desire, that desire, that desire, that desire. Ultimately, he came to Kundalini. It's the same. Yan neti neti vachanai nigamo avochus. When you got saying not this, not this, not this, not this, not this, then you go to a point where you say then, what ultimately left is the desire, which is the pure desire, the desire that is the good. Say for example, you say I'll have a house. No, no, I'll not have a house. I'll have a car. No, no car. No, I'll not have a wife. I'll not uh, look at any woman. I'll have nothing to do with it. I'll give up this, give up that, give up that, give up that, give up that. Till you reach a point where you are at an absolute point. And there you realize that the Kundalini rises. But I think it is going too far. Why not start from the Kundalini right? There. It's a simple thing. So Sahaja Yoga is the other way around. That you better start from the Kundalini. And neutralize all your left side. You see the point now? That's why Buddha was always regarded as an atheist. He was not. He was not an atheist. But as a matter of policy, he and Mahavira, they were contemporary, they decided let's not have the name of God anywhere near. Because once you start the God business, big philosophies are built and people just start claiming it. I mean, they become that. Actually, uh, uh, anybody who reads Gita becomes a sort of a Krishna, Shri Krishna himself is the way he talks. People, I mean, you can be shocked the way they talk. I mean, they are Shri Krishna giving an advice to Arjuna, you know, sitting on a chariot. They behave in that manner, you know, their style is like that. I, I met one fellow called Chinmayanand and I was amazed, you know, the way he was talking. I was surprised. I mean, he was just behaving like Shri Krishna, of course, horrid looking. But um, we thought he was Shri Krishna himself, you see. So that's what identification takes place with human beings when they start talking about God or His ways and others. So he said, "All right, put that out. Just talk about self-realization. That's the first step." And Mahavira joined hands with him. It helped that time very much to all the people who were in the name of ritualism. You see, they would say it's very difficult. You know, Hinduism is the most difficult. You have to fast on Sunday because of the sun, Monday because of the moon, Tuesday because of the Mars, like that went on and on. And when do you <coughs> eat your food? <coughs> if you have to achieve God, then you have to take your bath at 4 o'clock and do this and do that and shave your head and then become a sannyasi. And you can't eat this, and you can't eat that, and you can't do that. All those things, rituals, they start. But he felt that, supposing if you take to sannyasi, so half of your desires are finished. You are a sannyasi, uh, you are doing God's work, and there is no need to have a family or anything. So half of your desires are finished. If you have a family, then you want to do something for the family. You have to look after your family, and all that is to be done. But he did not realize that he was a realized soul, others were not. You see, if a realized soul does that, it has no difference to him. Whether he has a family or no family makes no difference to a realized soul, because he is not attached. But to a person who is not a realized soul, supposing he will give up his car, he will give up his house, go to the Himalayas, there what he will do? He will have a hut and have a barbed thing around. <laughs> then he may think of a Georgian style of a house. <laughs> because according to them, 
Georgian style is unpretentious. So we can have, after all, we are sannyasi. <laughs> That's difficult. I tell you, all our uh, uh, Western mind is behaving in that way, if you see, that we should be unpretentious. You see, it's very fussy. It's a word they will use. If you put even a little, oh, it's very fussy. They want everything to be plain, bland, you see. But what about inside? It's filled with what? This all bottled up with all kinds of rums, this, that. But the outside should be absolutely large. <laughs> the food should not be, if possible, just get it in its natural form. If not, don't have any taste in it. It should be so bland that any guest who comes to your house must starve. <laughs> All these funny ideas crop up of asceticism. Then we have other people like Shambhalas who are... <laughs> going now to Gobi Desert. You see, they thought that de this desert is not sufficient. Let's go to Gobi Desert. So they are going now to Gobi Desert. All these absurd ideas came out of Buddhism and also Jainism. Jainis went to the other extreme in vegetarianism because Buddha himself was not a vegetarian. Do you know that? He was not himself a vegetarian nor was Mahavira. You'd be surprised. Vegetarianism for them was a philosophy. It was not a uh, sort of a thing where you don't eat meat and all. Because Buddha himself died when he went to one of his disciples who was a um, hunter. And the hunter had killed a wild boar. And he said that the wild boar has been killed just now and it will take some time to cook. It's rather half done. I mean, he being an Indian, he could not eat that half done thing and he got diseased. Of the, I think his liver or something got into problem and he died of that. See? I mean, I can't eat half done food myself, you see. This is half done now. Half done is a horrible stuff, but we eat because it is unpretentious, you see, or some sort of a thing. People have idea it's not, uh, it's very next to the nature, you see, this is what is coming. But is all deliberate. You are attached inside, outside if you behave like that, you are not going to become that. Like hippies have an idea if they live like uh, primitive people. Uh, then they become primitive. You cannot, your brain is modern. Just by living, you see, wearing a wig like a hippie, can I become primitive? I cannot, my brain is modern, you see. That's what people don't understand, that we are too deliberate and all these deliberations can be only reduced if your self comes into your attention. Otherwise, all these are just our mental projection. So all this sannyasa and all these ideas came. Gradually everyone who came on this earth, people have really made a mess out of them. And Buddha's mess has gone to such an extent that if you see that, you'll be shocked. It went into many formations. But I heard from my son-in-law that he went and visited some of the caves where the very early Buddhists live, very early Buddhists live in the caves because they were not supported by kings or anything. So they had a very bad time and they used to live in the caves. And what my son-in-law told me that in the caves there are writings. In Sanskrit, in Pali and in Indian script saying that it is the spontaneous happening that can bring forth the self life. He's got that photograph. So it's coming from. You see, so they knew about it, the Sahaja Yoga. They knew about it. But then as every religion has gone into a mess and a lot of funny sort of, uh, we can say, the uh, funny sort of uh, expressions. Also, Buddhism has gone, it became Mahayana, Hinayana, all sorts of things. But one of them was called as Viditama. 
who ran away from India, settled down in Japan and he started the Zen system of religion, which he kept to the spontaneous happen. That's one was preserved. Another was the Lao Tse style, who did not talk of God and of Buddha, but of Tao itself, the energy, or we can say about the artist. So these two good things came out. While they searched back into the history of China and they found out the Adi Shakti lived many years back there as Kuan Yin. And that's how Kuan Yin was established as a goddess for many Buddhists. Now then, Buddha also got uh, into another form because there was a big competition between Hinduism, Hindus of those days and the Buddhist. So they wanted to form. For ordinary people, it's very difficult to understand the philosophy. So they thought that we should have Buddha expressed as he has been and he will be. So they formed their uh, See, as you see, he's a Maitreya is going to come, the future Buddha is Bodhisattva, and they started making his statues and everything. So they made Buddha as the god. They started using him to represent the uh, divine power, giving him forms and things. <coughs> and like that, many things happened. But Buddha himself was so much frightened of the ritualism that he, they said, you should not worship anything, you should not build any temples, so, you see, the loophole was found out. If temples are not to be built, we will build stupas. Now, in the stupas, they put the tooth of Buddha. Of course, that was sensible to do, I must say. But, of course, Buddha had said not to do it. And they put it there. He had two disciples called as Sariputta and Mughala. They were very good disciples of his. And their bones were collected after they were burnt out and were put in the stupas. That was something definitely sensible to put them there. Of course, the bones and all these things should not be disturbed because it's not good, it creates a problem for the body. But at least if they have put it there in the Mother Earth, it would have been all right, but they put it in caskets. Now the first casket was made of gold, the second of silver, the third of iron. The fourth one of wood, sort of thing, you mummified those things. And that was a very wrong thing to do because if you go on keeping like that, some parts of the body of these great people, it can hamper their rebirth or their body, which they want to again incarnate. But hair is all right or nails are all right, but you shouldn't keep the part of their body like that. And this kind of thing gave another nonsensical ideas to horrible human beings. What they did, that they thought that if we have to keep some part of the person who died like divine person, why not we cut the hand of someone and like that. So in Tibet and all these places, especially in uh, Ladakh, you see, they used to cut the hands of the people when they died and big ritual for the dead and then they started going towards the dead. So they start mo started moving towards the left side. Most of the Buddhists moved to the left side, which was absolutely prohibited by Buddha because he is on the right side. He said, cut down your desires. Do the karmas without the desire. This was his idea. Activate your right side without the desire. This was philosophy. But they, all of them are left side. They have desires, not only desires, but whatever they do, do it out of desire. Like the worst is like the Japanese. They think that you can uh, commit suicide in the name of your nation. With this desire, they will commit suicide. To save their country, they can commit suicide. I mean, it is absurd. 
He said, whatever you have to do, do without the desire, which is a difficult thing for human beings. How many there are who are doing it without desire? And whatever we do, we do out of desire. Even at a subtler point. Even when we do puja, we do with the desire that our vibrations will improve. Can you think of a state where it is absolutely desireless? Only one person has that. That's so desire. Desireless. The whole thing is done without any desire, so there is no disappointment. There is no unhappiness. You are going to America knowingly that is going to be a horrible experience. But it's a joke. Just going to see the joke. Uh, without any hope, maybe it might work out to be something tremendous. But no desire. See, it's so desireless, the whole personality is, that even if I have to desire for something, I have to ask you, do better desire, because I have lost the sense of desire. So many times I have said, you better do it. Unless and until you pray to me, I can't do it. That's why I ask you, write to me a letter, because you see, I can't desire. I really don't, I don't do anything. Without doing anything, it is happening, so why should I desire? I really don't do anything. You'd be amazed, I don't do anything, I don't desire anything, nothing of the kind, it's working, I'm just watching it. And you are saying, Mother, you are doing it, I'm quite surprised. <coughs> <coughs> that is Tao. If you read about Tao, it is said that it doesn't do anything, but everything works out. So this is what he said, which was all Sahaja, that you have to be desireless and do everything and he is the one who controls our ego. Because if you have no desire, you will have no ego either. Ego is only built up when you have a desire to do something. That is, you just do it for fun, just for joy, just for doing it. Then how will you build up ego? You cannot. Like an artist is painting just for fun and throwing it. Creating something just for fun, that's what God is. Not with a desire to achieve something. I mean, the desire is so gross, can be extremely gross. It can become subtler and subtler and subtler. That's a good thing. But it can be very, very gross also. Like some people can believe that, you see, I should paint it because I'll get so much money. Or I can sell it to somebody who may be the worst man, but I'll sell it because I can get more money. That's absolutely the grossest of all, you see. That you can go to the most sinful things, I mean, I don't know. There can be even worse desires than that. There can be very many. But on this auspicious day, we should not think of them, which are there like that. But minimum of minimum, if we come, just do your puja just for the joy of it, not with any desire. Just for the joy. I mean, we are doing so many things like that. For exa example, we enjoy each other's company. Just just think of that. We also, yogis, are enjoying each other's company. What's this for? Nothing at all. There's no, nothing. Just, we are enjoying it without any desire. Just for enjoyment's sake, enjoyment. When that purity comes, you see, in our temperament, that we do everything without any desire, we have got rid of our ego. The Buddha is awakening in us. And that's what is the importance of Buddha, that he settled down himself in a place which is the most difficult place, that is on the left side of your head, you see. Sometimes I have seen projects here up to this point, you know, in some people. They get such a terrible pain, you know, pulling it out from there. Can't imagine. So this horrible point, which is so funny, it is sometimes it can blow up like that. You see, sometimes it can pierce through. It's a horrible one, which all of you have developed quite a lot, you see. And it takes its forms in different ways and methods. For that, we have to say, Buddham Sharanam Gacha. 
means we surrender ourselves to Buddha. Then what does he say? The second one is very good. Sangham Sharanam Racham. I surrender myself to collectivity. Sangham. Sangha is the collectivity. I surrender myself to collectivity. Ego goes down. First of all, Buddha, who is sitting, who is the deity, which is the enlightenment, you say, I surrender myself to Buddha. Secondly, you say, I surrender myself to collectivity. Egoistical people cannot surrender. So, I surrender myself to collectivity. So, we say, Sangam Sharanam Racha. It is to Virat. Virat. It is the third one. Dham Sharanam Rachami, Sangam Sharanam Rachami. The third one. Dhammam Sharanam Rachami. Dhammam Sharanam Rachami. Dhammam means uh, the religion, the balance. I surrender myself to religion, which is essence of or you can put it the other way down that buddham sharanam gachami, dhammam sharanam gachami, sangham sharanam gachami. That's all. If you have achieved it, then we can talk of God, not before that. So these three things are to be achieved. We would put it in a Sahaja Yoga way like this. First of all, dhammam sharanam gachami. I surrender myself to my virtues. All desires can be surrendered to your virtue. Is it virtuous to do like this? You can. If you are brought up that way, you will just not do it. You will have no desires to do something that is not virtuous and righteous. You will just not do it. So, dhammam sharanam gachami. Then you should say, buddham sharanam gachami means, I surrender myself to my enlightenment. This is the second state when you are ascended. Surrender myself to Enlightenment. Enlightenment that I have got to my spirit. <coughs> it's the spirit who is going to die. No more my physical, mental, emotional, nonsensical temptations. But what is the spirit? And thirdly, the Sangham Shanam Lachami to the collective, to the whole, to the Virat. This is the way we have to work it out. So ultimately, we reach the same point. That let me start it from myself. From myself to others, not from others to myself. It's like treating the tree from outside, not from the roots. But Sahaja Yoga treats you from the roots. First you get your realization, all right? Then you learn how to surrender yourself to your dharma. Then you become collectively conscious. Collectivity is a temperament, is a sense of enjoyment that you get in the collective <coughs> living. Unless and until you have that, you are not achieved. So Buddha has played a very great role in our lives and he is a very great, powerful force within us. I'm very happy that Buddha Jayanti has fallen here in England because, as we say, the England is the heart of the universe. It doesn't matter if I say here. Is there anybody Arab here? <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to leave any Arab if you sit here. All right. I, if it is the heart, Whatever you do here is something in the whole universe. So if you can conquer your ego here, we can even conquer the ego of Mr. Reagan and these Russians. We can manage that. But first start it here. It has to reverse back. You see, now they have to learn from you and you don't learn from them. When it will work out, you will be amazed. Ego is the only problem I always face, reaching their hearts. If ego is removed, <coughs> everything will be alright. So for us, 
the great mantra is Uddham Sharanam Gacha. These three mantras you must say every day, I think, to get rid of this horrible ego. Now, any questions on Buddha you have? I've made it in a short way. The whole life history is very difficult. Mm. It's the city. You go. English are wise people, sound people. And they must understand this, that it's a very, very important thing, that they should not lose these qualities and should try to fix their enlightenment in such a way that it circulates. Any question? Someone told me yesterday it is Buddha Jaya, I was very happy. But in England I have not talked of Buddha, but otherwise I have talked about him also. Hmm. You know, that's why I go, you see, a Buddha shop because it is suggestive of a detached mind which has no color. And uh, there could be a personality which is colourless. But you can have it covered with colours to make others happy. So when you are a realised soul, whatever you do is natural. Whatever you do. If I am wearing this, now I am a Buddha. When I take it out, I am a It's not a drama. But if you are not a realised soul, before that whatever you do is just a drama. For example, this is an artificial thing. I put my hand there, anything, nothing will burn. But if it is real, it will definitely burn whatever I make up. Like that. So if somebody is a real person, whatever he does is not a drama, is a reality. That's how they say that she can take this form, she can take that form. People don't understand how can one person take so forms, can. If it is reality, it can. Like the Mother Earth, she is a reality and the sap that is coming from the Mother Earth takes so many forms. See her power. Flowers, this wood, different colours, fragrance. So many things. This one mother earth is producing all these things. Because she's reality. The reality in her can produce. But unreal things, whatever you make out of unreal things, they may look real. But they are not. So now let us have the food. 
And for the rituals also, he said, because most of them were unrealized things in those days, that they, whatever puja did, was unreal. It was not real. Had no meaning. It was giving no effect. See, worshipping a person who is unreal, or any deity who is unreal, or those who were not real people, in the realized souls, was this of unrealized people worshipping me? I mean, I would not allow any unrealized person to worship me at all. You see, I always tell people, and listen, they are perfectly surgeries, you know them, they are good, please don't bring them for puja. It's troublesome to me, much more than to them. You see, they also feel obliged, as if, you see, they are obliging me, they think so, by worshipping me, I don't know. But they don't know how much they are troubling by coming here without realization. So the ones who haven't got realization are really troublesome. They don't help. So the myth some people have that if they come to a puja before realization, they'll get realization in it's not true. Should not bring anyone who is not a realized soul or who is not a Sanjogi to a puja. It's troublesome and that person also starts doubting this, that. It's better not to do such a thing. Because also such a person is half baked. So no use giving me half baked cakes and spoiling the half baked cake also permanently. Because if you take out a half baked cake, you see, it's spoiled forever. I can't eat it, nor you can bake it again. So what's the use of bringing somebody who is half baked? All right. So from next time, also this is out of compassion. You do it. I know you do it out of compassion, but this is not. Why? Doesn't help me, not it helps others. Alright? So from next time, also any time, you must find out the circular saying that unless and until you are sure about the realization of a person that is not a realization, you should not call them for the future. They are no good for mother and they are not good for themselves. Because they become, you see, doubting or something. And you cannot really give them realization after that. Surely. You remember your friend had the same problem. Who was he? Make or something. All right. So now we can come and you can do the Ganesh Puja. Nishabd Dhyan Me Bane Rehte Hai.
दोनों हाथों को जोड़कर श्री माता जी के श्री चरणों में प्रार्थना अर्पित करते हैं परम पूज्य श्री माता जी आज का यह सामूहिक ध्यान हम आपके श्री चरणों में समर्पित करते हैं श्री माता जी आज की अमृतवाणी में आपने जो हमें ज्ञान प्रदान किया है कृपा कर वह हमारे अंदर घटित हो जाए श्री माता जी संपूर्ण जग में विश्व निर्मला धर्म स्थापन करने हेतु कृपा कर आप हमें सहयोग प्रचार प्रसार का एक शुद्ध और सशक्त माध्यम बनाइए परम पूज माता जी कृपा कर हमारी सभी प्रार्थनाओं को स्वीकार कर हमें आशीर्वादित कीजिए नमस्कार कर कलेक्टिव बंधन लेते हैं आज का ध्यान केंद्र यहीं पे संपन्न होता है आप सबका हृदय से धन्यवाद जय माता जी